express this move those language requires up to the top of the stack modules and it just works. So you have to be really careful about those language requires unless you are really sure about what we're doing. So uh, DB schemas, right? I mean we as front-end developers hardly get to touch the backends and design schemas. And you know, the concept of a good DB schema or a model uh, schema designs was pretty alien to me back in the days. So uh, here's the problem I was trying to solve. I had to store uh, those prizes which I was scraping into my DB somehow. Right? And this is the schema I, I had come up with back. So this object at the top is the you know containing the date and the price. And what I did was attach this as an array within another document. I'm using MongoDB over here, uh, for reference, right? So uh, it worked pretty well until the number of items or number of price histories were low. As soon as you know the uh, number of price items kept increasing, uh, the system started uh, getting slower. Why? Because insertions, updations, aggregations with arrays don't really scale because the system has to sort of copy all that array into your memory, then process. And then, whatever operation you're trying to do with that. Uh, so, what really helps is unwinding those array elements and storing that as an individual document within the collection. Right? Instead of injecting an element inside an array element, create a new document altogether. Uh, and what happens because of this is MongoDB, or any NoSQL database for that matter, gives you a lot of uh, APIs. Uh, to basically aggregate or doing operations in multiple documents. But it doesn't really expose a great API for uh, you know, doing things with arrays as data structures in general. So memory is a bit cheap, uh, but if you tend to use the APIs which the uh, memory exposes, then it tends to keep the process uh, system overall pretty lightweight. And it just tends to keep working. Now continuing the same discussion, uh, this was about the insertion of data in the arrays. Uh, let's look at the Shita's home page, which used to look like this. So uh, what this basically shows is all the products which anybody in the system is tracking, um, sorted by some logic, which is uh, how many people are tracking most number of products, um, all the price histories that have happened uh, uh, with, with a particular product, uh, whether or not a product is a good buyer in this way, sort of maths had to go in with a lot of uh, with, a, with a big data set basically, right? And uh, given my data skills, uh, what I had done was basically use dot finds uh, at at my DB, right? Now what dot find basically does is that it copies all results in memory depending on whatever query you give it. Right? It will query that DB, grab all the results, copy it back in your memory. And now you are maybe using Node.js to process that data, right? Uh, and back in the days when the number of products weren't even that much, it was taking up to like four minutes to create that JSON for the homepage, process everything, uh, and that basically just kept growing exponentially with growing number of uh, products as well as product price histories, right? So uh, a solution had to be uh, thought about that. Uh, discussed that with few folks at workplace and recommended you know, using aggregate level APIs that uh, you know, the MongoDB by itself exposes. So instead of you copying results in memory and then processing through Node.js, you essentially use those documents which you just created uh, in the collection and ask MongoDB to run your summations or whatever group guys you want to do and then return those results. Right? So aggregate basically return those computed results back instead of actually copying everything and then you're doing your maths through Node.js. So uh, that sort of brought down the time from 4 minutes to 8 seconds. Uh, so pulling data in memory to process uh, might sound like a good idea when you're operating at a small data set, uh, but as soon as you uh, are dealing with a large data set, then it tends to be comfortable. Uh, Alright, so we need to spawn a lot of processes in the backend, right? For instance, if you have to take a, uh, let's say you have to generate an invoice for for, a, for an order, right? So you will probably spin up a phantom JS process in the backend, which will take a screenshot of your HTML page, generate a PDF, you attach it in the email and send it to the customer. And that's how it generally works. Uh, and that's a pretty common use case of uh, you know spinning up a new process in the backend. I was doing something similar. I 
was uh, basically using a phantom JS wrapper for capture JS, which can accept any selector on an HTML page, and it will basically take a screenshot of that, uh, you know, document. What I did in three days was one time the Amazon updated its DOM structure. Uh, it removed the selector I was trying to wait for, and because of the code that I had written, it wasn't really handling the case when the selector is in the way. Right. And this Node.js process thought, okay, this screenshot didn't really come up, so let me try to spin up another process. But the selector was pretty there, right? So you can imagine what happens, right? It's, it's probably a eight GB machine you have uh, running on distribution, and Node.js just keeps spinning up new phantom JS processes, right? And you are out of memory in no time, right? So uh, this whatever communication happens between Node.js and phantom JS, let's call it some interface communication which happens. If you can't really control that. Uh, at least have a timeout after which that process gets deleted or captured. Right? So be careful when you are essentially uh, not sure if uh, this this connection gets broken, what's going to happen, happen next. Right? So as I said, you know, just create like thousands of random just processes, and it basically screwed up the whole server. So Chipas was relying on third-party services to grab its prices. It would scrape Amazon, uh, Flipkart, Snapdeal, uh, any website, any number on a page. You could basically scrape from the system. Uh, so it was in this exercise that I learned a lot of things dealing with third-party websites. Uh, and there are a few lessons that I learned out of it. So if you're making a backend backend request, uh, then the that request client does not really send a cookie by default because it's not a browser, right? So it doesn't really have a user, it doesn't really send a cookie. So backends can flag that out, right? Uh, some developer who has written the code for Amazon, he knows whether a cookie is coming or not. Right? So he can flag you that you know it's, it's a bot probably and it can block you. But what then happens is uh, with that response, it sends your cookie back, right? And now you can use that cookie and make another request, also known as a cookie jar, and now you behave like a user. So to all those systems which do not let you make a request directly, uh, you can basically make two requests and fake around their systems. Uh, then there are bot captures in the sense that if you are making uh, you know thousands calls to Amazon at 12 pm, 3 pm, 6 pm, 9 pm every single day, then it can flag your IP address for such patterns, right? So any pattern that you're trying for instance, set up a cron job, right, to make regular uh, scraping requests. Uh, Packets can basically track that. So what you need to do is you need to rotate the IPs, change the user details, uh, probably pay for some proxy services, uh, so that you make believe that Amazon service that you know you're a legit user who is trying to grab the HTML. Uh, there's another thing called Honeypot. Now what this means is if you're building a product which uh, essentially clicks on all the things on the page to spread the wings and basically uh, click on more links. Uh, so what Honeypot is, it's a hidden link which is not really visible to a user, but it's put in specifically for a bot or a crawler uh, to click, right? And if any click on that link happens, then uh, it flags you for a bot activity because the user can't really see that link, but this link actually got clicked. Right, so you have to avoid the Honeypot, you have to be careful that only the links which are visible on the page get clicked. Jeffrey lets you easily do that, right? They can pretty much just use his and your code or whatever to, before you actually click on links. So, such things have to be thought about before you write a simple script. So, I spent like thousands of dollars in paid proxies because I had to uh, support the system for thousands of users who were trying to use the service. Um, IP rotation is actually cheap, uh, free proxies don't really work. Uh, and the companies who provide you paid proxies are very expensive. So, but there is no other solution, I mean, if you want to scrape a service as huge as Amazon and grab prices every few minutes or every few hours, uh, right? So I thought, I, I said to myself, how can I be the cheap ass? I mean, I'm helping people save money, uh, but I'm not saving money myself, right? So what can I do with my systems that can help people, that can help me save money uh, by maintaining this service? Right? And that led to a lot of research in terms of um, what are the alternates possible to free views or services. 
and how can I make this service free for myself? And that led to a venture into this whole new uh, buzzword called, called serverless technologies, which is not really server, but yes, you are relying on somebody else's servers to uh, you know, get things done. So I took it as a challenge to basically use a whole problem statement uh, without having to maintain any servers by myself. Right? And here are the ingredients to that, uh, to solve the same problem. So you need a couple of lambda functions, uh, one key value stored, which could be DynamoDB, Firestore, any of these services, uh, one web server which can be put up on search.sh, zeeknow, Heroku, anywhere. Lambda functions can be from uh, you know, Google Cloud functions, Amazon Lambda, any of these. Right? Uh, but this is what I went ahead with, just with the helicopter. I mean, AWS Lambda, Google Cloud, Firestore, and zeeknow. So here's how the user journey uh, for adding the product, I and mean, this is what is available now as a do-it-yourself platform. Uh, which is essentially you cloning a few repos and providing a few access keys and you have your own you know, price drop engine up and running. So here's, here's how the user journey looks now. So here's the user who tries to add a product by a, say a Chrome extension. He clicks on a Chrome extension which makes HTTP forward to a node server. Uh, this node server basically stores this in some products collection in Google Firestore. Right? So this is how the user essentially adds a product into Google Firestore in our database basically. Right? Uh, then there is one lambda function which runs a headless Chrome. It's always running on a code, right? And the task of this lambda is to open a page and scrape the HTML and send it down. Nothing happens. There is another lambda running which does a lot more things. Its task is to communicate via HTTP to our remote server. Um, it also runs a prompt task which I talk about. Its task is also to, also to parse the HTML which our browser sent and grab any full data out of it. Right. So take JSON out of it and send it back to our ZKNOW server. So now the problem statement is that a lot of users have entered all the products they want to grab. And what you want to do is you want to grab all those products as a list and scrape them. Right? That's the idea basically. Uh, so it could have been this sort of a way where in Amazon Lambda itself makes that query to Google Pipe Store, grab all the products, dispense itself up several times and this works. But due to certain technical limitations, you can't really do it. You can't install Google Drive Store's client side libraries on Lambda due uh, to certain user restrictions they have. So, uh, what you do is you run a cron job on Lambda. Uh, all that does it, is it tells the node server to talk to the Pi uh, Store and grab all the products back. Right? And now, what the Now server does is it spins one Lambda function per product in parallel. Now this is the beauty of the whole architecture. Now what happens is, every lambda invocation happens on a unique IP address. Right? So, what you gain out of this is something immense. You are essentially grabbing all the products, which could be millions in numbers, and you can spin up millions of lambda functions in parallel, and you can still have a response back in under 5 seconds which was a nightmare to manage if I was, if I was managing my own servers at that scale, right? So now the scale you are supporting is the scale of whatever lambda can support. So each of these lambda invocations then creates those browser invocations which sort of, you know, returns that raw HTML back to the lambda, which parses this HTML back, uh, JSON back to the node server, which talks to Firestore and stores that new price entry. Right? And this now node server gives new knowledge of the new price. It figures out if a new price drop notification should be sent back to the user or not. If it is, then it sends that back. So, this is how I sort of decoupled all of my services and made these individual services which sort of manage themselves. And all you really need to do is clone a couple of uh, you know, GitHub repos, provide new keys, and deploy them and stuff up and running. Right, so this according to me is scraping at scale and ready. Right, you can support millions of component requests out of the box. There is no maintaining browser instances. Uh, there, is, there are automated, automated IPs thanks to how cloud functions execute. And all the third party functions work for free in their own box. This is a very crucial point as well. Because when you are dealing with third party functions, you don't know what can be. There are like n number of situations which arose every single line, and I had to put my brains around what's happening, what, what went wrong. Right? So when you decouple all these responsibilities into separate machines, 
uh, you know exactly which machine is telling and what tasks what uh, did we work out today. Right, so I moved from a self hosted nightmare JS or a video sort of a installation to progress on Lambda. I moved from a self hosted MongoDB installation to Google Cloud Firestore. Uh, moved away from paid proxies, which was a huge saving to AWS Lambda. Uh, moved away from servers and load balancers um, to you know, Zeta. All three services all have amazing free tiers, so you are pretty much running a service for free for yourself. If you do not want to do social service like I was doing, uh, then you can direct it yourself. So I'll share the uh, links to these reports uh, Alright, so the next part of the discussion would be about um, you know all the product learnings I had, um, sort of building this as an individual owner or owner. Uh, so what I learned is if you create your backend flexible enough uh, to be able to uh, to be able to work out for any client, then creating more clients is really easy. Uh, I created a bookmark link, there were Chrome extension, Firefox extension, an iOS app, Android app, uh, and a website. Like there were seven clients possible to simply add a new product to the service and receive push notifications, browser notifications, and whatnot. Right? So if you make your back backends flexible enough, then uh, without really touching your backend, you can just keep spinning up more and more clients. Uh, right, so same endpoint consumed by several mainstream clients. Uh, there was this one time effort of building an iOS app. I had to design this, I had to create the React Native components, and uh, the Android app kind of preloaded itself. I could just reuse the same React Native components which I had coded for iOS to a larger extent, uh, of course, not 100%. Uh, but the design would be just small because it used algorithms if you're kind of working on your own side project kind of thing. Okay, so this is how the iOS and Android apps look like. The only difference as you can see is you know Android, you see that lower bar coming in and it doesn't appear in iOS because that's what the platform supports or the box. It also had a Twitter bot which uh, just kind of kept tweeting about all these price drops which are happening and that uh, led to improve the SEO juice as well because there was now a lot of cheap ass, cheap ass, cheap ass going on on Twitter all the time which uh, led to Google believing that yeah, it's a genuine website because actually you actually do about it uh, it always ranked number one on Google if you search for you know, price orders in India or whatever like, that is the whole reason why cheap ass as a product survived without spending a penny on it because it, uh, it's SEO juice was amazing without doing anything so, uh, a lot of companies talk about, um, you know, we offer privacy, we have pro privacy, and nobody gets to see your data in the systems and whatnot. Right? But um, uh, you don't really know if that's the case. I don't trust them for that. Right? So, uh, what I did with Chinas was everybody bought a unique dashboard link. Uh, what that means is if you and I, track, uh, you and I are tracking the same product, we have separate price histories for that. You see separate graphs for it. Depending on when you start tracking, uh, you have a separate link for that, right? So nobody could really see who is tracking what in the system by, say, tracking a password. There is no password for that, uh, right? So it's, it's pretty much like if you want to say delete a system, they delete a product in your system. You have an OTP on your login. You say you want to log into a system. Uh, OTP comes in in real time in your email box. You use that to log into the system. And do whatever you want to do with this. Right? So if you are a single owner trying to deal with a product, the security, the authentications and whatnot, they right? get way too overwhelming. Right? So try to reduce the amount of hassles you have to uh, make while maintaining a uh, product. And that's the path I chose basically. Um, nobody likes spam. Uh, right? Nobody likes to see jam emails coming up in your email box. Uh, but I did. Um, I, what I did was I captured uh, live deals from Amazon, Flipkart, uh, the same captured deals from what we were talking about. So what we essentially did was right before sending the email, it would open the Amazon.com's uh, lead page, take a screenshot of it, inject it within the email and then send it. Right? So anybody receiving any email would always have a live deal going on on one of these sites. 
and that led to amazing open rates of the emails because people thought that even if they are not interested in buying this product right now, no matter what the price is, they will at least get to see a deal which has just come up in their email box without really opening Amazon or Flipkart or any of those. Uh, right, so this is how it used to look like uh, somebody grabbing uh, the thunderbolt display, the price of happen, but a real time deal uh, went in, and that says ends in 19 hours, right? So that sort of uh, is, a, is a way to hook people into opening your emails. Uh, I used to use this service called Postmark, um, and I think 40% average email open rate is a big number. Uh, by any industry standards. Uh, so, Tiny Center really go a long way. Uh, when I was just starting this project up, and um, people were talking about it, but not really talking about you know you're you're doing something, but it's not really being talked about. Uh, I I got a bit panicked. Yeah, like let's make the service famous, right? And what I did was I basically partnered with Recharge, told them you know was giving some X thousand rupees of coupons. And I'll tell them I'll promote you in my emails, right? And I told people that you know if you read about me or about Chikas on social media, then I'm going to give you some free coupons or whatever. Right? And they actually did. People actually started posting pictures on Facebook about Tinder buying buying some Chikas, right? Just for some fifty bucks of coupons, right? So people do that, that kind of thing. So that's that's pretty much it about the talk. Um, I would like to conclude it by saying that you know there is no perfect product. Um, I started this to solve my own edge, scratch my own edge. I wanted to buy a phone and an iPhone, and uh, whenever I would open uh, Flipkart, I would see a different rate. Um, so that got me thinking that okay, to buy this product right now, I can't do it manually, but the next time I do it, I really want to automate this process myself at least. And that's what I did. I built a very simple input box of page. Uh, which they cannot have any other input, just input calls and just send me emails about all the types of stuff. So people started using the email, they at least let me input my email ID as well. Right? So whatever customers had to say, I listened to them, right? And let them uh, you know tell me what to do with this product for them. Right? So there's no problem product to be honest, uh, it's okay to have outdated libraries. Uh, I don't know at the time of shutting it was shutting it down, it was still running on over point ten. Uh, Udan mode, right? And it's okay to not build everything in the first go that you're dreaming of, right? Because often we hold ourselves back to build something because we think, you know, it's not good enough. Let's not put it out because uh, this is not the perfect thing that I'm imagining in my head, right? But uh, I started really small and it worked out pretty well. That's my personal opinion about this. It's great to get feedback, feedback you know, and listen to customers because they know exactly what they want uh, and let them drive your product. If you are at least building a side project or something to this uh, Right, so the product we worked for about three years, we shut down, and you know, the iOS and Android apps were pretty much really only to begin with. All you could really do was see a list of uh, you know, products and just receive push notifications, nothing more, nothing less. Only when people said that they wanted to add a product via Amazon, uh, you know, on the iOS app, I added that feature. So that's how 